chapter three, linear regression from the book. And the book discusses um, this data set. So can someone let me know if uh, you can see my screen? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, thank you. So the data set that is used in this chapter is the advertising data set where we have uh, TV, radio, and newspaper budgets and the sales as the response. So TV, radio, and newspaper budgets are the predictors. And uh, this is from chapter two where we see the points as our data and the blue lines are the fitted linear regression models. So the chapter starts with these questions. Is there a relationship between advertising budget and sales? How strong is that relationship? Which media are associated with sales? How large is the association and so on? So we'll come back to these questions after discussing uh, the basics. So to start, this is how a simple linear regression model is defined. Our response y is approximately related to uh, this equation, a linear model, which has these two parameters, beta naught and beta one, and x is a predictor. So in that advertising data set example, x would be like TV budget, and beta naught and beta one are the coefficients of this model. Beta one can also be treated as a slope uh, for the variable x. Now we see here uh, we use the approximate uh, operator here because uh, we are missing the uh, epsilon, which is the irreducible error. So with the assumption that there is a linear relationship between the response and the predictor, uh, we can approximate that relationship uh, using the sample data that we have. So once we collect the data, we have the variable X, like the TV budget, and the linear model can then predict what would be the sales as Y hat. So this is an example of using TV as a TV budget as uh, the predictor and the sales as a response. And the fitted blue line represents that linear model. The vertical lines between the points uh, from the data and the predicted <clears throat> line represent uh, the error terms. They are also called as residuals uh, in the book. So there are different ways to assess the fitness of the model, and the book discusses the residual sum of squares first, uh, which tells us uh, how much is the overall uh, fitness of the model. So RSS is estimated by summing the squares of all the errors. So all the errors as shown here, the vertical distance between the points and the line. So we square them and then we add them and that can also be represented as uh, a given value y1, which is the observed value of the sales and the predicted value from the linear model. So uh, based on some calculus, uh, the uh, coefficients can be estimated using uh, these formulas. So we have beta one hat and beta not hat. Um, and here this uh, is not very clear, y bar is clear, uh, the y uh, dash and x dash. Uh, so this formula can be used uh, to estimate the slope and this formula for the intercept for beta naught is this one. And here's an example of uh, visualizing the fit based on different values of these coefficients. So if we look at it in the book, it's right here. So 
So on x-axis, we see the different values of beta naught that are tried and beta one on y-axis. And we see the contours show what happens to the RSS, which is the residual sum of squares. And the red dot on both of these plots indicate the minimum RSS, which is the goal when we are fitting the uh, linear model using the least squares criteria. Any questions so far? Then once we have fit the model, we want to see uh, the accuracy of the estimated coefficients. So looking at the model back again, uh, we can assess that accuracy using uh, the residual standard error. So residual standard error is an estimate of the variance or standard deviation. And the formula is using the uh, residual sum of squares and dividing it by uh, the number of observations minus two. And then the standard error for each coefficient can be estimated using these formulas. So uh, the book talks about uh, an analogy of uh, estimating the mean value uh, of population given the mean value from the sample. So it says that when we are estimating the standard error there, in that case, the, the formula is sigma squared uh, divided by n. And so based on that formula, when we extend it to the coefficients, then we got uh, these equations for estimating the standard error in the coefficients estimates. And 95% confidence interval is another way to look at the accuracy of these coefficients. As uh, so using the standard error, we can find out the intervals, the minimum and the maximum value between which we expect the true value of the parameter to be. So we have an estimate based on the equation, uh, based on the least squares criteria that gives us beta one hat and beta not hat. And when we estimate the confidence interval using these two equations, we can then uh, get an interval, confidence interval for both uh, coefficients. And we can say that the true value is somewhere between those two intervals. So if it is very wide, then it means that we probably not have very accurate results. And narrow uh, interval uh, indicates uh, better results. And another way to assess the accuracy is to use R squared. So uh, one thing that RSE or the residual standard error is limited in is that it depends on the range of uh, Y, the response. So in our example of predicting uh, the sales of a product based on the budget of uh, advertising on TV, uh, the range will be uh, the range of response, which is the sales. Um, so we can only talk about that within that range, uh, the value of the RSE. The R squared, on the other hand, has a standardized range, which is between zero to one. And so a value of R squared, which is closer to zero, indicates that the uh, fit is not very good and a value closer to one indicates that there will be uh, a higher fit of the model. And so the R squared formula can be, uh, is, is used here uh, as one minus the residual sum of squares and divided by the total sum of square, where total sum of square is defined here by using the mean value of Y. Then we get into multiple linear regression where the simple linear regression equation is extended with more coefficients and uh, given the number of uh, uh, 
uh, response, uh, sorry, the predictors. So uh, if we have also data for um, the radio and newspaper budget, then we can express them as X2 and X3. And if we have more variables, then up to XP variables. And then that would be the equation of the linear model. And so beta j here are the uh, average effects on y from xj, which are the responses, holding all other predictors fixed. So uh, there's an example in the book where uh, there is model fit separately for each of the three budgets uh, as our uh, predictors. And so if we get three separate models, we are predicting sales based on TV budget or newspaper budget or uh, the radio budget. But uh, what it is lacking is we don't know what is happening with the other variables as we are changing the value of one variable. So let's say if we only have y equals to beta naught plus beta one x1, where y is sales and x1 is TV budget, then as we uh, change the TV budget by a unit of one, we expect that on average, Y will change by beta one value. But we don't know what is happening uh, to the changes in radio or newspaper budgets while we are varying the value of the TV budget. They may be correlated, they may not be. So we don't know what is happening to them. Using the multiple linear regression has this advantage that we say that as we change the value of x1 by one unit, we are keeping x2 and other x values the same. We are not changing them. We are looking at the effect, average effect on y given the change in a single predictor. Um, and here's that example of using newspaper alone. So if you use that alone, then you get a slope of 0.055. This is the standard error. And if you use multiple linear regression, then uh, we get this value of the uh, beta one coefficient, uh, the beta coefficient for uh, newspaper, which is a different result, a totally different result because we also have a negative sign here. So that indicates that uh, newspaper is uh, neg negatively associated with the sales. Then the book raises some questions. Uh, is at least one of the predictors useful in predicting the response? So to answer that, we can find uh, or estimate the F statistic. So F statistic tells us uh, if uh, beta one is equal to beta two or is equal to up to beta P equals to zero. So if all the coefficients are zero, that means there is no relationship between the predictor and the predictors and the response. So F statistic checks for that. That's the uh, hypothesis test that F statistic does. And so if we have a value close to one, then it indicates that there is no relationship. But if we have higher values than one, then that indicates that at least one of those coefficients are not zero. Do all the predictors help to explain why, or is only a subset of the predictors useful? The p-values can help identify the important predictors, but uh, there is a chance that if we have a lot of uh, variables, lots of predictors, then just by chance, P values could be small. At least one or two values could be small. And so uh, instead of relying only on P values, there are methods like forward selection, backward selection, and mixed selection of the variables. So let's say we have uh, 15 uh, different predictors in our data, and uh, we want to see which one are important. So if we fit the model and look at only P values, there's a chance that some of them will be low just by chance. And so um, we need to either do forward selection, backward selection, or mixed selection uh, to get um, a better model. Uh, do you want me to go into details of these different selection methods? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yes. I think uh... okay. 
So forward selection is where we fit the model with only uh, the without any variables. So we start with an intercept only model, then we add one variable, and uh, let's say we add only the TV budget, and uh, we look at the p-value. Then we add another variable, and then if we have um, a variable there or predictor which has a higher uh, p-value for the t statistic then we remove that uh, variable. We remove that predictor from our model. The backward selection is the opposite where we start with all the predictors in the model and we look at which one has the highest p-value. That means that it's not significant. We then remove that and then keep doing that after refitting the model with the remaining variables, looking at the p-value. So we keep doing that until we are left with only those variables that we see are significant based on the p-value. The mix selection uh, is where we can, uh, we will do both. So we, uh, we add multiple variables at the same time. So let's say we start with backward selection and then uh, we see which one has a higher p-value, we then remove it. Then we look at uh, the fit again with the remaining variables, then look at the p-values, and so based on uh, continuous forward and the backward selection, we can do mixed uh, selection. So book doesn't show any example of that, uh, but I think with mixed selection, there could also be some factor of uh, domain expertise. So if you already know uh, that some of the variables are definitely correlated with the uh, response, then we can select those definitely, and uh, we can look at others uh, based on significance. Um, how well does the model fit the data? So we discussed the, uh, the RSE value and R squared. So R squared uh, can be used or RSC can be used. RSC has this formula for multiple uh, regression. Uh, given a set of predictor values, what response value should we predict? and how accurate is our prediction? So there are three sets of uncertainty in predictions. Let me get to that. the last question. This one. So there are coefficient estimates um, and we are doing it only for the, uh, for the estimate for the true population regression. So inaccuracy could be related to the reducible error. So uh, let's say if we are not using the least squares then definitely there's a chance that the coefficients that we estimated are not uh, providing the accuracy that we desire. And uh, another source of uncertainty is uh, model bias. So model bias is where we're using linear, because it's a linear regression model, it assumes linearity. And so the actual data may be nonlinear. And so there is always some inherent bias that linear regression model uh, has because it's, it's assuming linearity. And the third uncertainty is about irreducible error. So we have um, a part of the error which is irreducible because this is happening just by chance, also called as noise sometimes. And so uh, we don't know what is the source of this error and we cannot reduce it. And this is other than uh, the predictors and the relationship between predictors and response. So other than quantitative variables, we uh, can also use qualitative variables or predictors in the regression equation. So here is an example where uh, we have uh, two uh, two uh, variables, or actually one variable, which is qualitative, 
and it is made a dummy variable uh, be from a given level of k it is then divided into k minus 1 dummy variables so this example shows for three levels so let's say we have a variable which has three different values let's say for gender or something else and for for that qualitative variable we can divide it into uh, two variables where the first one uh, is level zero where both uh, the uh, second level and the third level are going to be zero so the model would then be y equals to beta naught only so beta naught is for the baseline level so let's say we have three levels zero one and two and for level zero we have the equation y equals to beta naught this coefficient is only for the baseline level then for level one in our example we then get to uh, the x i one value to be one so the equation would then be y equals to beta naught plus beta one x i one where x i one is now one and for level two we have this whole equation uh, the alternative is to use index variables although this Part I didn't see in the book. Uh, this is only from the slides. Uh, what I understand about it is that uh, we're using this equation. Um, so we, we are not using axes here, the predictors. We are directly using the coefficient values, but all three coefficient values are used regardless of what is the level. A linear regression model can also be extended to include interaction effects, also called a synergy in the marketing field. So interaction effects is where we consider the interaction between two variables. Uh, there could also be more than two variables. Um, so the example that's used by the book is that uh, we may have a relationship between or correlation between uh, the TV budget and the radio budget. And so if we increase the TV budget only, then it may also affect the radio uh, budget. And if we only uh, increase the radio budget, then it may also have an effect on the TV. And so uh, if there is, a, there, there is an interaction, then we need to account for that. Um, if we get to that point in the book. So this is how that equation would be expressed as. So we have uh, x1, which is the TV budget, x2, which is the uh, radio budget, for example, and we then have a direction effect where x1 and x2 have another coefficient beta 3. If we rewrite that equation, then it would look something like this, where we now have x1 common and beta 1 plus beta 3 x2. And so this is given another notation as beta 1 with tilde at the top. Uh, this is an example that discusses the lines and workers. So in a factory, if we have lines and workers increasing the lines would only be beneficial if we also have more workers to work on those lines. And so there's an interaction effect, but only if the workers are available. If they're not, then increasing the lines by the, themselves would not be beneficial and not be predictive as well. Uh, another example is based on the uh, advertising data set where TV has its own coefficient and radio has its own coefficient, but then there is a coefficient for the interaction between radio and TV budgets, and which can be expressed or rewritten as this equation. And so if we are to increase the TV budget, that would also affect radio budget. So it may be beneficial to increase the budget for TV and radio by equal amounts, 
rather than only increasing the budget for TV or only increasing the budget for radio. Another point that the chapter discusses is that uh, if we see that all of them are significant, for example, here we see the p-value for the three uh, coefficients, and we see that they are well below uh, the 95% level, um, they are considered to be significant, but it's not a good idea to only include the interaction term. Uh, it's better to include the TV and radio coefficients in the equation as well. We can also use uh, non-linear relationships uh, in the linear model. Uh, for example, uh, we can use x squared or x to the power n, which are called as polynomial fits. So if we express our x or the predictor as x squared, then it will still be considered as a linear model. So for example, if you're looking at the relationship between mileage and horsepower, then we may have an equation like this. And uh, here's an example where we have uh, the data points as circles, and we're looking at the relationship between horsepower and miles per gallon. The linear line is this orange line, and the uh, polynomial fit with two degrees is the blue line which seems to better capture the relationship, the non-linear relationship, but we're still using that linear uh, model equation. But if you increase uh, the degrees of the polynomial fit, it may look better on our training set, but it may not be a very good idea to make, use such a, a flexible model uh, at this level of uh, uh, degrees, for example, five degree polynomial fit for this kind of data. Because in our test set, uh, because of overfitting to the training set, we may not get good results on the test set or the new data set. The book doesn't discuss what happens if we use a uh, five degree polynomial fit, but I'm guessing that that's the main issue. We could likely overfit. Then the book discusses some potential problems. Uh, for example, for nonlinear relationships, we can identify the nonlinearity using residual plots, which looks something like this. And uh, if we see no pattern in the residual plots, then uh, we assume that there is no, uh, no problem with uh, nonlinearity. So residual plots are plotted by using the fitted values or the predicted values on x-axis and the residuals on the y-axis. We could also have correlation of the error terms. So one of the assumptions of the linear regression model is that the error terms, the residuals, are not correlated. But if they are correlated, then our model fit is not reliable the estimates that we get are not reliable. Um, there is this nice package that I found called as performance, and it is a very good uh, package with functions that can check multiple uh, assumptions of the linear model. So for instance, here they fit a model with mileage and uh, from the empty cars data set. Uh, so these are the predictors. And if you use a check model from the package, we get this plot. So for instance, this is looking at the linearity by doing the residual plot. Then there is uh, something called as posterior predictive check, which is, I think, not part of linear regression. The model check is probably um, Bayesian modeling. and. Uh, we also see what are the influential observations, uh, like the leverage and so on, which we'll discuss in a moment. And uh, the normality of the residuals, which is another assumption that all the residuals are normally distributed. 
collinearity is another thing that we are going to discuss in a moment. So this plot is really, uh, this function is basically really helpful uh, from the performance package on our linear model. Can you throw that uh, link in the chat? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So uh, another assumption is non-constant variance of the error terms or, or the problem. The assumption is that the variance of the residuals is constant, which is also called as heteroscedasticity. So for instance, on this plot, we see that there is this uh, cone-like or fan-like uh, pattern. So as uh, we go uh, on, on the axis from left to right, uh, the residuals are changing shape. And so this uh, indicates that the variance is not constant. But this can be handled by transforming uh, the response. So here, for instance, uh, a log of the response is used. And then when it is uh, when the model is fed to these data, then we have mostly gotten rid of uh, this problem of uh, non-constant variance. Another potential problem is uh, having outliers in our data. So outliers have this very particular definition in the linear regression uh, context uh, that outliers are points with uh, for which yi is far from value predicted by the model. Uh, I haven't seen this definition before. I think it is uh, specific to linear regression modeling. Maybe it is extended to other models as well. Um, but for instance, uh, when we create a box plot, that also provides us with uh, some outliers. But it has its own algorithm to do that. So we can detect outliers by plotting studentized residuals um, and look for residuals which are larger than three standard deviations. So here's an example of the outliers. So the point 20 here is an outlier because it has a Y value, which is very different from the predicted line. But in this case, even if we fit the model with or without it, we don't see a lot of change uh, to the intercept or to the slope of this line. But it is very clear when we look at the residual plot. And so studentized residuals is, uh, is a method that we can use explained in the book uh, that uh, will tell us that this is a residual. Through visual exploration, we can then uh, identify the residuals and maybe get rid of it if it's, uh, for example, due to a typing error or something. But if it is not, if it is part of your data, then uh, it may be interesting to further investigate. Then another problem could be high leverage points, which could affect uh, the slope uh, or intercept significantly. Uh, here in this example, the point number 41 is a high leverage point because the X value is very different from the remaining X value. So if you look at the range on X axis, we see that this point is at the value of four but the remaining points are less than three. So this is definitely a high leverage point. But sometimes uh, for a given predictor, it's not clear visually if 
uh, if a given point is a high leverage point or not, because it is well within the range. But if we plot uh, two predictors simultaneously, we could uh, identify them. Uh, and if still it's not clear from that kind of plot, we can also uh, estimate the leverage statistic. So here's a formula for estimating leverage statistic for simple linear regression. Uh, the formula for multiple linear regression is not shown here, uh, but I think using the performance package, you can also estimate that. And maybe there is some discussion in the labs, which we will get to in the next week. So this plot shows the example of uh, the point 41, uh, which is very different from the other points on this plot. So using the leverage statistic, we can identify high leverage points. And again, uh, just like outliers, we may choose to remove those data points uh, and then fit them all with their many data points. Another potential problem is uh, collinearity between variables. So collinearity is where two predictors are highly correlated. So if they are correlated, there's a detailed discussion in the chapter that shows how that would affect our model predictions and also the model fit results. And so it may not be reliable. So it is better to drop one of those variables. There could also be multi-collinearity. So for collinearity only, we can identify that to some extent by looking at a correlation matrix. If there is a high correlation, Pearson correlation, then we may choose to drop one of the variables in our uh, uh, model. But uh, multicollinearity is where we have multiple predictors, three or more, which could be correlated. And in that case, we cannot just identify them using correlation matrix. So in that case, we can use the statistic called as variance inflation factor. Um, so the, uh, the parameter R squared here is the R squared uh, as we discussed before, but it is for uh, the X, J predictors. So we, we use a given predictor, for instance, in our example of uh, advertising data set, we have TV, uh, newspaper, and radio as predictors. So what I understand from this formula is that we estimate R squared by fitting a model where TV is the uh, uh, is the response and newspaper and radio are the predictors. Then we repeat this for the other two. And so we estimate VIF for a given uh, parameter or predictor using uh, that formula. So if we have a high value here, that would indicate that there is multicollinearity. The book says five or 10. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Is it five or is it 10? So it says if it is five or 10 higher than that, so it says as a rule of thumb, a VIF value that exceeds five or 10 indicates a problematic amount of collinearity. So I'm not sure which one is it. If it exceeds five or exceeds 10. But maybe it depends on, on a given context. Does anyone have any ideas? I've used VIF before. Uh, I, I don't know, but I assume your, your guess is correct that it would just depend on the field or the context in which there would set whatever value I'll give you an example in the labs. We'll see. No, I think also, I think the performance package that you show, I think it also has a function to check for VIF. I think that is how me, I normally do it. I'll just go to performance and check. Yeah, so yeah, here VIF is estimated. And in this example, we see five to 10 color differently. Yeah, ten, more than 10 is 
grad, so maybe that's yeah, there could be different levels, five to ten, and then more than ten. So by the end of the chapter, uh, they have a marketing plan that answers some question uh, on that advertising data set. So is there a relationship between advertising budget and the sales? The discussion uh, has multiple regression model fit, and then uh, F statistic is estimated. So with F statistic, we can tell if uh, any of the uh, coefficients are zero. If the value is higher, which was in this case, it was higher than one, uh, so we concluded that, uh, that there is a relationship. How strong is the relationship between advertising budget and the sales? So as we discussed, there are two ways to look at uh, the model fit results. RSC, which is residual standard error, but it is specific to the range of the response. And R squared, which has standardized range between zero to one. On Wikipedia, I found that uh, R squared would also be negative, up to negative infinity. So below zero means that the model that we are using is no better than um, it's actually worse than just averaging the response if it is below zero. But in the book here, uh, it only uses a range zero to one. Which media are associated with sales? Uh, we can use p-value uh, for each predictor statistic. And it's also further discussed in chapter six. And in the example for advertising data set, uh, other than newspaper, they concluded that using TV, radio, and an interaction of TV and radio uh, gives uh, better results. How large is the association between each medium and sales? So to look at that association, we can look at the confidence intervals, because if we are only estimating a given coefficient using the fit of linear regression model, that gives us a point estimate of that coefficient. With confidence interval, we have two more values, and we expect that the true value of the parameter beta lies between those two confidence interval values. How accurately can we predict future sales? So if we want to predict future sales, there could be two ways of looking at it. One is to look at an individual response, so an individual uh, sales value that we want to predict for a given product, given the predictors, or it could also be an average response. So if you're looking at average responses, then we also estimate confidence intervals. But if you're looking at individual response, then what we estimate is a prediction interval. Now prediction interval will always be wider than confidence intervals because prediction interval considers both the relationship between y and x, which in this chapter was linear, and the irreducible error. Confidence interval is only concerned about y equals to f of x. It does not consider the irreducible error. Is the relationship linear? So uh, using the residual plots for the advertising data set, we find that indeed it is linear. We don't have, um, uh, have nonlinearity uh, based on the residual plots. Is there synergy among the advertising media? So synergy is the marketing lingo for interaction terms. Um, and they, they concluded in the chapter that using uh, interaction terms between TV and radio provides a better model fit uh, and also significant results. Then the very last uh, section of the chapter was about uh, comparing the linear regression model with k-nearest neighbors. So k-nearest neighbors can be used for either regression or classification. In this example, uh, they find 
uh, with using different values of k, we get uh, different types of results. And the conclusion was uh, that if we test the mean squared error of kn, uh, if the test mean squared error of kn is only slightly lower than that of linear regression, we might be willing to forego a little bit of prediction accuracy. So the mean squared error for the test data was a little bit lower uh, than the mean squared error for test data using linear regression model. And so since linear regression model has uh, this uh, advantage of interpretation, it is very clear the relationship between X and Y. Uh, it's better to use linear regression if the overall mean squared error is not very different between the two models. I guess that's uh, everything in this chapter. Any specific questions you have while you were reading? I was thinking about that on on the in the three dot eleven section um, on the confidence intervals versus prediction intervals. Is, is so I'm trying to think about this. Is the confidence interval talking about the population? And the prediction is talking about the individual observation. Yeah, I I, I think so. I I also have that uh, as my understanding. Is it three point three point eleven? Uh, it was in the other tab, I think. Oh, this one. Yeah, that one, 3.11. Yeah, in, in the fifth one there, yeah. Yeah, so in this section, this is uh, how accurately you can predict. Yeah, this, this is what the chapter has to say. Uh, chapter doesn't show how prediction intervals are estimated. Uh, we have the examples for confidence interval, but I'm not sure how it's practically estimated. I think there's something called as conformal prediction. I haven't used it, but recently there was a surge on Twitter about it. I think it's probably something about that where you are concerned about whenever we're doing predictions in machine learning, we have a single value for a given X. And so prediction intervals will give us those intervals like confidence interval. And But I'm not sure what are the details in practical manner. Yeah, I saw uh, Max Kuhn had a talk at the Posit conference about that. I watched it. I'm not sure that I understood it, but. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, I, I see. The, the confidence interval determines how close the estimated value of the response, the y hat, will be to the, to the fx, the model that we build in terms of the average response. So, so that that measures the re reducible errors. So, in, in terms of the, you how you build in the model, you use the these squares, and that method is commonly be believed that it generates the least reducible error. And then, uh, uh, and in terms of the prediction interval, uh, you I use we use the y hat, the estimated value, to predict the the actual y of one response. And it will be uh, uh it, there will be uh, the random error, the epsilon in this model. So, so that's my guess about the relationship between the confidence interval and the prediction interval. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there's some discussion in the labs. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah.
any other points, uh, topics? If there is none, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the presentation, I think it was a uh, bit, it was clear enough. I think I really picked some, learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you uh, very much. So I think we'll be looking forward uh, to the lab uh, the same time next week.